Have you considered upgrading your home network with 10 gigabit capability, but thought the cost was too high? Think again. Today we have an exciting topic to discuss. The Microtic CRS 309 1G 8S plus IN 10 gigabit switch. In this video, we'll dive into its specifications and explore its unique features that can enable you to have affordable 10 gigabit networking in your home. The CRS 309 is a capable yet compact switch or router designed to meet the demands of small business and home networks. With its impressive feature set at an average new cost of $270, it stands out among its competitors. Now, let's delve deep into its key specifications. The CRS 309 is very small at only 10.7 inches wide, 6.2 inches deep, and 1.73 inches tall, so it can fit in any rack. It's also very light at only 1.1 pounds. Microtic includes long and short ears for mounting in a rack alongside the rest of your equipment as well as rubber pads for the underside for desktop deployment. For processing specs, the CRS309 is equipped with an ARM 32-bit dual-core processor operating at 800 MHz along with 512 MB of RAM and 16 MB of flash storage for the operating systems. They run Microtik's proprietary Linux-based operating systems, SwitchOS or RouterOS, allowing Layer 3 control. It also supports firewall capabilities and VLAN trunking. Despite having a dual core processor and plenty of RAM, if running in router mode and with lots of routing management options enabled, it's unlikely you'll be able to get 10 gigabit speeds due to taxing of the processor. Long story short, use it as an L2 switch for 10 gigabit deployment and leave it at that. It has eight SFP plus ports, one gigabit ethernet port with PoE input that has direct access to the chipset for network routing or management, and then one RS-232 console port. The Gigabit PoE Ethernet port gives you a neat option. You can either directly power the unit using power over Ethernet, or use the power adapter, or use both for redundancy. It has an extremely bright blue light on the front side of the unit, so you're sure to know when it's powered on. It also has a built-in speaker that emits a single beep to notify you when the bootloader is finished, then followed by two beeps when the firmware has completed loading. For power, it uses just a small 24 volt, 1.2 amp power adapter with a barrel plug. One of the nicest aspects of the CRS309 is its low power consumption. It has true idle power consumption of 8 watts with an upper threshold rated for 23 watts. So far for me, with three clients connected, it has never exceeded 10 watts. The low power consumption enables the use of a passive cooling system with heat pipes running from the CPU to a radiator attached to the rear of the unit. This also makes the system very quiet, actually completely silent. During light to mid-level usage, the rear radiator is just barely above room temperature by touch. Opening up the unit, you can see the heat pipes running from the ARM CPU to the large heat sink at the rear. Once again, since I can't leave anything alone, I remove the heat sink and replace the thermal paste with some Noctua NTH2. Did it make a difference? Probably not, but placebos can be very powerful. Something that immediately caught my eye for modding is that there's traces on the PCB where a four pin header could be soldered on. After checking the traces with a multimeter, I wasn't able to detect any voltage as it appears to be completely missing the 12 volt power regulator that would be needed. Sucks, but oh well. You can always tap into a USB port outside the system if you want to run a fan or two inside to blow across the internal SFP ports. Being a 1U rack height, you can definitely fit a 20 millimeter fan inside standing up. There's also two other PCB traces for what's labeled PSU1 and PSU2, which I'm guessing was possibly Microtics attempting to allow scalability with this board in another model, or maybe a potential future revision of the CRS309. For the operating system, the router OS is honestly not very intuitive at all. Sure, once you spend enough time with it, you can get used to its layout, but don't expect to dive in and immediately start implementing advanced routing control, which I don't even recommend doing with the unit anyway. It's so matter of fact that you may need a networking Bible, depending upon your skill level, but still way better than a straight command line only interface. The Switch OS is much more forgiving and intuitive. The six megabytes of onboard RAM allows both operating systems to coexist at the same time, allowing shifting from one to the other 
without having to perform a flash at all. You can manage the switch using Winbox or WebFig, with Winbox being the default main application used to manage the switch. The latest release of Router OS version 7.9 was actually just released a couple of weeks ago on May the 2nd. I primarily got this switch to make an immediate jump to 10 gigabit Ethernet to utilize the Cat5e cabling that I already ran. I tested the CRS309 RJ45 transceivers with and without a small fan blowing on them. With a 1G connection and no fan, the transceivers easily get up to about 60C or 140 degrees Fahrenheit. With a fan, it drops the temperatures down to about 47C. Cat5e can support 10 gigabit Ethernet, but depending upon the quality of the cable and the connectors, it might not. Length of the cable and cable quality is everything. If you look on the internet, you'll see specifications ranging all over the place. But generally, you're looking at 10 gigabit Ethernet over Cat5e having a common maximum of about 45 meters or 147 feet. This is assuming that the cabling is solid core UTP and not stranded. Again, depending on the quality of the cable, some types of high quality Cat5e cables have actually supported up to 10 gigabit Ethernet up to 60 meters or 196 feet. But keep in mind that the actual throughput experience may not live up to the connected or displayed bandwidth that your network adapter is reporting. Think of the connection speed as the diameter of the pipe connecting two devices, where throughput is how much actual true amount of data transfer that can take place. You can have a pipe that's a huge diameter, but interference from nearby power cabling, crosstalk from other transmission cables, or inadequate connectors may prevent you from ever reaching the announced connection speed. In general, CAT6 has the potential for 10 gigabit Ethernet up to 180 feet, and CAT6A and CAT6-7 can do 10 gigabit Ethernet up to 328 feet, all due to the better interference control methods, such as shielding for individual wires. The overall key with everything is guaranteed quality versus potential quality. The higher the cable's rating or quality, the better the chance you have at reaching a fast communication speed. One potential caveat with the CRS309 or any SFP Plus switch comes down to heat, but not in the area that you may think. 10G Base-T Gigabit Ethernet transceivers get very hot when operating at full connectivity, even running very hot while not even having a client powered on at the other end. So, while the overall unit itself is staying cool, the front transceivers are smoking hot, easily approaching 90C or 194 degrees Fahrenheit. Because of this, Microtic recommends running a maximum of only four RJ45 transceivers with the intention of either keeping empty SFP Plus ports between them or having fiber transceivers between them. Attempting to have four side by side is a recipe for having the two inner modules overheat. Official Microtic RJ45 transceivers are pricey and run anywhere from $70 to $80 each. You can find cheaper alternatives, but you have to do some homework to make sure that the non-microtic transceivers will be compatible with the switch. All things considered, heat, slightly higher cost of RJ45 transceivers versus fiber transceivers, and the potential for crosstalk with copper, fiber is definitely the better route. But if you have quality cabling already installed and plan on using just a few RJ45 modules, the CRS309 is perfect. To decide to use RJ45 10 gigabit Ethernet is definitely a decision that you need to weigh with a microscope, assessing nearly every single minute detail of your infrastructure, as well as all the caveats. Being loaded with eight SFP Plus ports, it at least gives you options for cabling to change things up for future scalability. You can also use what are called DAC cables, or Direct Attached Copper Cables, which are pre-made cables with built-in transceivers, and they're very cheap, ranging anywhere from $10 to $30 with all of the connectivity you would need minus the PCI Express cards themselves. But routing them to clients in different rooms of your house can be difficult. With that said, they're best used for connectivity to servers within the same rack or room as the Microtic switch. There's quite a few things to pick apart with DAC cables, so I have to save that for another video. If you're interested, Microtic lists throughput tests under various conditions on their website. I'll post a link to that down in the description. Multimode fiber cables and transceivers would most likely be the go-to for a home lab unless you're fine with the RJ45 copper caveats. Multimode fiber is rated for 10 gigabit up to 984 feet with an upper threshold of 1300 feet. So 
more than enough for home distances. You can get multi-mode fiber transceivers for around $40 to $50 each. They still put out heat, but not nearly as much as the 10G Base T RJ45 transceivers. There's also single mode fiber cables and transceivers available that have the potential to reach distances up to six and a half miles, but the cables and transceivers are more expensive and the chances of needing that much range in a home situation is ridiculous. So just concentrate on multi-mode if you're going fiber. Just like the 10 gigabit SFP plus transceivers, 10 gigabit RJ45 PCI Express cards draw a decent amount of power and put out a lot of heat. I have three Mellanox Connect X2 dual SFP Plus PCI Express cards that can be found for around $20 to $30, and you can also get LSI SFP Plus cards for about the same price. Intel X540 RJ45 copper PCI Express cards range at about $40 to $90. There is something that I want to make note of concerning the Mellanox Connect X2 and Connect X3 SFP Plus PCI Express cards. The Connect X2 was originally released in 2009 and the Connect X3 in 2012. They both still function perfectly up through Windows 11, but Windows 11 has a minor but still frustrating issue. Task Manager networking shows no activity for the adapter whatsoever. After doing some digging, apparently the general Connect X version 2.8 drivers that are supported for Windows 11 only support Connect X4, 5, and 6 cards. This driver issue does not impact performance at all, but does not allow you to see what the current network activity is in Task Manager or in the network connection window for the adapter itself. That as well as some odd driver errors listed in the firmware properties. It shows connection duration and the negotiated speed, but never any sent or received packets. It looks like I'll be on the lookout for a Connect X4, which is in the $90 to $120 range. Now, since this unit was released, Mikrotik has released the CRS310, 1G, 5S, 4S, plus IN that has five 1G SFP ports, four 10G SFP plus ports, and an additional one gigabit ethernet management port. Being priced at only $178 new, it's somewhat taken over the reins from the CRS309 for many uses. In all honesty, if I didn't get this CRS309 so cheap and was planning on running fiber, as well as not using my already ran Cat5e cabling, I would have opted for the CRS310. If you're fine with fiber and only have four systems needing 10 gigabit, get the CRS310. If you want more scalability, technically more bandwidth at 162 gigabits per second versus 92 gigabits per second, and are okay with 10 gigabit ethernet copper, the CRS309 would be the better call. That wraps everything up. I hope I covered all the bases that you might have had questions about and hopefully maybe covered some you didn't even know you had questions about. Either way, again, thank you for watching. If you like this video, please hit the like button and we'll see you at the next video.